If the Lord chose to come back today, then right here, worshiping him this morning, our maker, and we're thankful for this opportunity we have today to come together and worship our God. I ask you to turn your Bibles today to Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6 is where we'll study from the Word of God this morning. We have visitors today. Thank you for being here. You're a special guest to us. And uh, if you're looking for a church home, please consider the Forever family here at Lone Cedar. We've got a lot of uh, children and young people and young couples and singles and elderly and middle-aged and just a wonderful church family where we strive to be that everybody is somebody. There's no big guys and little U's, and that's how it always should be in the family of God. And I just thank you, brethren, here for the love and the unity you have here, our good elders and their leadership. And so let's be thankful for one another as God's family. Two weeks from today, we're going to have a special treat of time. She'll be Brother Dave Miller, as we've been talking about, will be here. He'll speak at 9, 10, and 1230, a very timely message on what happens when America walks away from God. And our elders feel that we need this message at this time, and uh, Brother Miller dedicated his life to talking about this. We've watched uh, the videos that he has uh, made and, and the silencing of God and how this country is silencing God on every corner. And uh, he's going to talk about that with us and how we as God's people can help in overcoming the situation. We have flyers in the back. Uh, take some of those. We'll be inviting your friends and family and loved ones to come uh, and be with us uh, on March the 6th. Be back tonight at 6 o'clock as well to worship the Lord at that time. And uh, if you today are here and you're not a Christian for just some reason, you've never given your life to the Lord, you never obeyed the gospel, never been baptized into Jesus Christ, never come in contact with that blood. What a blessing you're missing. Come today. Take care of that. Take that fear out of your heart so that you can go home today and lay down tonight and have that peace that passes all understanding that you can know what it's like to live here and enjoy this life with peace and yet know that in the life to come you have eternal life. As we say many times, money can't buy that peace. If you're a child of God, you need to come back to your first love today. Maybe there's something in your life that you need to take care of and it's been bothering you. You do the prayers of this church family. We're here today to help you and to assist you. Earlier this morning, Brother Tate read for us from Genesis chapter 6 of how the world had become so wicked in the days before the flood. And in all this wickedness, in all the thoughts and imaginations of everybody was only evil all the time, there was one man that was striving to live for God. And the Bible says in Genesis 6 and verse 8, But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. You know, all of our lives we sought to find favor in someone, haven't we? You remember when we were little children, we would draw or color a picture? We'd take it to our, our mom and dad and we'd want their approval. What we were doing is we were seeking their favor. And did you ever have a favorite teacher in school? Maybe you worked a lot harder in that teacher's class because you wanted to find favor in their eyes. Well, this morning, I want us all to look into the corners of our hearts. And I want us to all to ask ourselves that soul-searching question, am I seeking to find favor in God's eyes? It doesn't matter what our family, our friends, our church family thinks of us. Because God is a searcher of the hearts, and he alone knows our lives better than we know ourselves. So let's ask ourselves this morning, am I truly seeking to find favor and approval in God's eyes? The Bible says, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Now, Noah's always been one of my favorite people in all the Bible. If you were like me, you probably first heard the story of Noah well, you was on your mother's knee, maybe, and she was teaching you and instilling in you the love of God. Or maybe you heard of Noah for the first time in a Bible class. But, beloved, because we learned about Noah at such a young age, I fear maybe today there's a tendency to think that this story about Noah is just a storybook character rather than a real, live human being that lived upon this earth. 
But we know God's word is true. And we know the Bible teaches that Noah was a real person who lived and he walked and talked on this earth just like you and I do. In fact, remember Jesus in the New Testament reminds us in Matthew 24, verse 37, that Noah was a real person. When he spoke of his second coming and he says, but as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. Now, besides the fact that Noah built that ark, what else do we know about Brother Noah? In Genesis 5, verse 28, the Bible says, Noah's father, his name was Lamech. And Lamech was 182 years old when little Noah was born. Now, parents, can you imagine a 182-year-old man down on the floor wrestling with a toddler? Well, going back even further in Noah's family tree, we discover in Genesis 5, 26, that Noah was the grandson of Methuselah. Now, who was Methuselah? We know that he was the oldest living man that has ever lived on this earth. And he lived to be 969 years of age. We also learn in Genesis 6 and verse 18 that Noah was a married man. Now the scripture never tells us his wife's name. We've always affectionately referred to her as Mrs. Noah. But the Bible does tell us in Genesis 5 and verse 32 that when Noah was 500 years old, the Lord blessed him and Miss Noah with three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And that each one of those boys eventually married. And of course, we know it was those eight precious souls that God spared aboard that ark when he destroyed the world with that great flood. But now, more important than all that biographical data about Noah was Noah's character and Noah's life. In Genesis 6 and verse 9, the Bible says, this is the account of Noah. Noah was a righteous man. He was a blameless man, not perfect, but there was no blatant faults in his life that he practiced. He was a righteous man and blameless among the people of his generation, and he walked with God. Now you contrast the life of Noah with the rest of that generation that lived in that day. Again, in verse 5 of Genesis 6, the Lord saw how great man's wickedness was on the face of the earth and that every imagination and thought of their heart was just evil all the time. They never thought about God. Now, does that not sound like so many in America today? The Bible says in verse 6, it repented the Lord that he had made man and he said I am sorry that I made man or in other words he was sorry that man had made the choices he made to live like he was living and it repented the Lord in his heart so the Lord said in verse 7 Genesis 6 I will destroy him in whom I've created from off the face of the earth men and animals and creatures that move along the ground even the birds of the air for I am grieved that I have made them but listen again at verse 8 in all this wickedness but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. That's where you and I want to be. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Now in the ten generations that had passed, from the time that Adam and Eve committed that very first sin in the garden, until now in the days of Noah, there in the beginning of time, man had become completely wicked and turned his heart and mind completely away from God and toward their own sins and lustful flesh. In verse 5, the Bible says, every imagination of their thoughts was only evil the whole time. Folks, the whole world was blanketed in the darkness of sin. But in all this darkness, the Bible says there stood one man whose life was shining like a bright star. And that man was Noah, a righteous and a blameless man, and he walked with God. Now, let's apply this to our lives this morning. The Old Testament is written for our learning, and we can learn some great truths to apply to our spiritual life today from Brother Noah. As we look more closely at Noah's life, I want to say very briefly three things. Three things that Noah did to find favor and approval in the eyes of God. Number one, 
Noah did what was right. Listen, young people. Noah did what was right even when everyone else was doing wrong. We've already learned that Noah lived in a very sinful society just like today. No one was doing right in the eyes of God out in the world and every, everybody's mind was just bent on doing wrong all the time. While everyone around him chose to do what was right in their own eyes, Noah chose to do what was right in God's eyes. There's a book called The Cheating Culture by David Callahan. And he says in this book that we're living in a time when everybody today seems to think it's okay to do wrong simply because everybody else is doing it. He's talking about how school students cheat on tests because everybody's doing it. Athletes sometimes are taking steroids because everybody's doing it. Doctors write unnecessary prescriptions because everybody's doing it. People illegally download music and movies because everybody's doing it. You know, the old devil is sneaky, isn't he? He is so deceptive and crafty and everybody seems to think today even those who claim to be Christians, sometimes we reject God's standard of righteousness in favor of what feels right to us personally because that's what society is teaching us to do. If it feels good, do it. You only go around one time. Enjoy life. Get the full gusto of life. And that's what society says. And, and that's why many people, even Christians, decide, I'm going to engage in this because, man, I'm out of touch. Everybody seems to be doing this well. In the eyes of God, right is always right, and wrong is always wrong, no matter how many people do it. Listen, folks, there's never a right way to do a wrong thing. Amen? There's never a right way to do a wrong thing. It doesn't matter if all 50 states pass and legalize, legalize gambling or as they have in the same-sex marriages or abortion, or all the ungodly things we're seeing in the world and country today, it'll never be right in God's eyes. The Bible says His Word is settled in heaven. And what God thought about all these issues a hundred years ago or fifty years ago, He still feels the same today. His Word has not changed. It'll never change. And our job is not to conform to what everybody around us is doing or even what the laws say when it's against God's law. But our, oh, our whole aim in life and our goal is to find favor in the eyes of the Lord because that's who we're going to give an account for one day at the great white throne of judgment for our life. It's whether we've transformed our hearts into His image or we've been conformed to the ways of the world. So if you and I are to find favor in the eyes of the Lord, we must do as Noah did in his day, and that is do right. Just make up your mind, I'm going to strive to live for the Lord and do right, even when the whole world around me seems to be doing wrong. Well, secondly, we learn that Noah walked, hear that word, Noah walked with God even when no one else did. Verse 9, he was a righteous and a blameless man among his time, and he walked with God. Young people, what does it mean to walk with God? It literally means we're trying our best to follow in our Father's footsteps in everything we do, say, or think. Now, we can't be perfect. But we must strive to be righteous. You know, Fellas, as little boys, can you remember, did you ever remember trying to follow in your daddy's footsteps in the snow? Or maybe out in the mud, and a lot of times, you know, when a boy chooses the same career as his father, he's said to be following in the footsteps of his dad. Well, when we follow in someone's footsteps, it means we stay in step. We're in time with them. And we follow in their path. And spiritually speaking, when we walk with God, we're following Him in the light. 
We're reading this book every day. We're not setting it on a shelf or leaving it in our car or leaving it in this pew and just pick it up on Sunday morning or Sunday night. We're living out of this book. We're letting God direct us through this book and we're walking with him as he guides our precepts through this book, the Bible. And I've always said if your Bible's falling apart, you're not. And the reason so many today's life seems to be falling apart is because they've fallen away from God's word. They're trying to get legal counsel and counseling from all the secular counsel of the world and all the wrong places when the answers to life are in this book. Spiritually speaking, we need to walk with God. As did Noah. Brother Doug led us in that song this morning, trying to walk in the steps of the Savior. How do we do that? We do that by his living word. This is what God spoke. He breathed it. And it's just as alive and powerful today as it was thousands of years ago when he spoke it. In Noah's day, no one was walking with God. Only Noah walked with God. And folks, I know it's tough to walk with God when it seems no one around us isn't. You know, some of you may work at a job. And in your workplace, and you dread heading there in the morning. In that workplace, you may be the only one, it seems, that's a Christian. And perhaps you're the only one who goes to church on Sunday. Perhaps you're the only one who prays before your meal there at the lunch hour. Perhaps you're the only one who doesn't take the Lord's name in vain or curse or use ugly, off-color jokes and profanity. Perhaps you're the only one who isn't cheating on your spouse or you're the only one who's trying to live right. You know, I've lived it and I've worked in it 25 years with the public. The workplace can be a tough place, can't it? And we have to have our mind made up. Daniel, the young man, he purposed in his heart he was not going to defile himself with the king's delicacies of that day. And we got to do that. we got to make up our mind. Purpose in our heart this morning how we're going to be when we walk into the workplace or the school in the morning. Because if we don't, oftentimes we'll be very vulnerable to temptations in life. Young people, let me say this. You're living in a very trying time. Young people, if your friends are smoking marijuana or taking pills or doing drugs, don't do it. If your friends are sexting or sending explicit sexual racy photos on their phone, don't do that. If your buddies are drinking and partying and going out and drinking and driving, don't do it. Just because everybody seems like it's doing it doesn't make it right. And be sure your sins will find you out. We may get by, we'll never get away. Sooner or later, Numbers 32, 13 says, be sure your sin will find you out. If not here, it will one day. When Jesus said on that day, there's nothing hidden that will not be made manifest. We may be hiding our sins from our family or our friends or our neighbors or our loved ones, but we're not hiding them from God, are we? God knows our heart. He knows our secrets. When he says, I'll bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Everybody in Noah's day was going along with the crowd, and everybody was doing it. And God destroyed them all, didn't he? But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. No matter how discouraged you may get at times, you keep on keeping on walking with God. You stay on his heels just as close as you possibly can. And if everybody else turns back and follows the ways of the world in your life that you're living around you, you purpose in your heart I'm never going to leave nor forsake my Savior. I want to know him in this life because I want him to know me when I go to leave this old world. And I'll walk through that valley of the shadow of death. I want Jesus to hold my hand. And I know if I don't know him in this life, he's not going to know me in the next life. And I don't want to have to be introduced to Jesus on judgment day. 
when I lift up my eyes in death, I want to be safe in the arms of Jesus. I don't want to live like the world in Luke 16, like that old rich man. He lived for the ways of the world, and one night he died, and the Bible said he lifted up his eyes in hell. Total darkness, a lake of fire weeping and wailing and crying and screaming and gnashing of teeth forever and ever. That's why it's so important to find favor in the eyes of God here and now. No matter what everybody else is doing. Because you'll not give an account for your family, your friends, your co-workers. Every man, woman, boy, and girl was given an account of himself unto God. You're responsible for your soul. And daddies, you're also responsible for the souls of those little children. It's your responsibility. You father them. You're their daddy. And the Bible says, fathers, you bring those children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. You are going to give an account one day for the souls of your children and how you're raising them and having them in Bible class or not. Children like arrows in the hand of a mighty man. And when we... In those days when they would take those arrows and let them go, they had to aim them carefully because their next meal depended on it. We need to aim our children toward God, don't we? We need to aim them in the right direction. And no matter how discouraged it may be, when everyone else is not walking with God again, let's keep on doing it. Noah did. And he found favor in the eyes of the Lord. And the Lord saved he and his house. Well, thirdly, this morning in our text, we learn... Noah trusted God even when he didn't understand. Noah trusted God even when he didn't understand. You ever been in that situation? God, I don't know why I'm going through this. In Genesis 6, verses 11 through 21, God reveals his plan to Noah about destroying the world. Verse 17 of Genesis 6, God told Noah he's going to do this by bringing a great flood on the earth now. you got to imagine. Noah had never seen or heard of a flood before. In fact, no one had ever heard of rain before. In verses 14 through 16, God gave Noah these specific instructions on how to build this huge boat, which is as long as three football fields and three stories high, and Noah had never heard of an ark. In verse 22, God told Noah he wanted him to take two of every kind of animal on board this old big boat along with seven members of his family. The Bible says everybody around here was mocking him and laughing at him probably and, and they, they were scorning him for 120 years as he was building this boat. Noah didn't understand just how he was supposed to get all these animals in that ark. As a matter of fact, he didn't understand any of God's plan. But notice verse 22. Thus did Noah according to all that God had commanded him. Noah didn't understand everything that God said, but he just did it. And that takes faith. And in your life and mine, there's going to be times when everything inside of us is crying out, God, this doesn't make a bit of sense. We may have something in our life that we want really bad. Maybe we've lost our job or we've lost our health or we've lost a loved one. And there's things in our life that we feel like we need so badly. And it seems that God is silent. But God maybe is telling us no when everything else inside us is saying yes. Or maybe God is telling us to wait when everything inside us is saying, go ahead, take that job, this job, do this, do that. Maybe God in his word is telling us, leave that alone. When everything inside us is telling us, you take it. You know, maybe God is telling us now is not the time. But everything inside us is telling us now is the best time. You know, how do we find the answers to life? Again, it's through this book and prayer to God. Proverbs 3 and verse 5, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. But in all your ways acknowledge Him. That's prayer and He shall direct your paths. There will always be times we don't understand God's plan or God's timing or God's ways. But listen, folks. 
God does not ask us to understand his plan. All he asks us to do is to trust him and obey him. We sing the song, trust and obey. There's no other way to be happy in Jesus. Day after day, for 120 years, Noah worked on that ark, again, perhaps without fully understanding what was yet to come, and yet he trusted God, he obeyed him, and he did everything God had commanded him. And because of this, Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Folks, like Noah, again, you and I are living in a world that is bent continuously on evil in the sight of God. There's no fear of God when you walk out those doors and so many out in this community today. There's no fear of God in the world. And like Noah, we're living in a world where it's becoming even more and more difficult to become a Christian. Young people, especially, we know on you and the pressures you face. And mom and dad, that's why we need to make sure we've got them in our Bible classes and we're teaching them the Word of God in our homes, at the front and before their eyes. And like Noah, we're living in a world that God has marked for destruction. The first time God destroyed this old world with the element of water, the second time he said, I'll destroy with the element of fire. Fire and water are both purifiers. When Jesus comes again, all the wickedness in this world is going to be over. And when our life is over, the greatest influence of a life well lived will not be to find the favor in the eyes of the people, of our family, of our elders, of our preacher, or anybody in, our, in this world. But our goal will be to find favor in the eyes of the Lord. Hear those wonderful words, well done, come your faithful. You don't ever want to be on that left side on Judgment Day. Hear those fateful words, depart, I don't know you. Folks, if we don't know the Lord in this life, He's not going to know us on that great and final day. When you think about your life this morning, I want to ask you, does God smile on your life? Do you find favor in your Father's eyes? Was there something in your life today that you know is breaking the heart of the Son of God. I beg you today, remove it, change it, fix it. Whatever it is, don't let anything or anyone stand in your way of going to heaven and living with the Lord one day throughout all eternity. I've told you many times, you're too precious to die lost. God loves you too much. He gave His only Son to die for your sins and mine that we might have life and have it more abundantly. He loves you today, and if you're not a child of God today, come today. Obey the gospel, be born into his family, be baptized into his blood. If you're a Christian, you need to come home this morning, and you're tired of living in fear and, and the things in your life that you know you need to make right, take care of that today. We're here to help you. We love you. While together we stand and while we sing.